When I look back into anime that really defined my early watching, there's always one that exists as integral, but also as an outlier. That show is Inuyasha. Well, back then most of my attention was drawn to power fantasies like Dragon Ball and Yu Yu Hakusho, I can easily say looking back that Inuyasha was something I remember actively looking forward to. While technically considered a shonen, this series highlights a romantic side of the two main characters not as a subplot but instead as a main focus. However, I suppose I'm already getting ahead of myself. Created by Rumiko Takahashi, who is best known for her series Ranma Half, which we will get to eventually, Inuyasha or Inuyasha A Feudal Fairy Tale debuted in Weekly Shonen Sunday mid-November in 1996 and quickly became Takahashi's main focus, longest running series, and set the stage for what would inevitably end up being this isekai riddled universe we find ourselves in now. While not the first isekai by any stretch of the imagination, it's easy to argue that Inuyasha was the first to popularize the genre on a massive scale during its launch on Adult Swim in 2002 where it ran until 2006, introducing the Japanese take on the in another world concept to the west. In this case, the other world being a version of the Sengoku Jidai of Japanese history in which all manner of creatures from Buddhism, Shintoism, and Japanese folklore run rampant as the country tears itself apart. Right in the middle of it is a 15 year old high school girl and a 200 year old dog boy with a chip on his shoulder who have to stop Japan's biggest dickhead from becoming a yokai god. But there's so much more to this seemingly simple shonen, so let's get into it. Hey everyone, Mike here off the cuff. I once again just want to say thank you so much to our patrons who are continuing to make this show possible. You guys are the absolute best and we continue to see more and more people coming and showing up and joining the community, being in the watch parties, hanging out on the discord. We can't tell you how much we appreciate it and we're looking forward to meeting more of you in the future. So check out our Patreon and let's get on with the show. So I'm just gonna go out and say it, Inuyasha is one of my favorite anime. It's got all the stuff you know I love, Japanese history, demons, and a buttload of sexual tension. There's also a lot of people who don't like the show, and their reasons are valid. First off, it is a long one, 167 episodes, plus a late game 26 episode wrap up called The Final Act. And if you think that's bad, then don't even look at the manga which I'm currently reading, and after 170 chapters, I think I'm just getting out of season 2 in comparison to the anime. The action is consistent but not always amazing, and watched out of continuation, the show can come off as a monster of the week kind of story lacking depth. But again, everything is about how you watch it. Here's the deal, we got Kagome, modern 90s Japanese schoolgirl whose family owns an ancient Shinto shrine. In that shrine is a mystical well her grandpa takes care of as a family priest. One day Kagome falls into the well, bam, she's transported back in time to the Sengoku period, which excites me. If you've been with us for a while, you know we've covered the Edo period in our Ninja Scroll video as well as our Kenshin video where we also talked about the Meiji Restoration. In our Demon Slayer video, we did a little lesson on the Taisho era as well. That is about 300 years of Japanese history, which is rad. Now the Sengoku period, however, predates all of that and is made up of roughly 200 years of complete chaos in Japan. The government had come crashing down and basically all the rich lords were constantly at war trying to fill this power vacuum until eventually Oda Nobunaga showed up and ushered in the Edo period, which again for the record was a time of relative peace. However, the Sengoku was a time of strife, conflict, famine, and pain for the average person in Japan. It was the time of the ninja and a period where education was generally lacking, leading many to be extremely superstitious. Obviously given the structure of Inuyasha, this time period is a perfect setting. Seeing as canonically Oda Nobunaga was alive during the time Inuyasha plays out, we can date Kagome's arrival to about 1555 AD. So again, she finds herself back in time and before long, she's in front of a tree that has a dog-eared dude stapled to it with an arrow. At this point, Kagome is caught by local villagers and taken in by their leader, Kaede, a Shinto priestess. In the middle of the night, the village is attacked by a big titty centipede looking for something called the Shikan Jewel and she chases Kagome back into the woods. Her cries for help wake up Inuyasha who has been nailed and sealed to this tree for 50 years and after having some of her guts ripped out by the centipede, it's revealed that the 
Shikan Jewel was inside Kagome all along. Centipede Lady eats it and loses all her Gentai potential, and as she's crushing Kagome and Inuyasha together against the tree, Kagome is left with a choice, free Inuyasha or die, and she very pointedly says, I choose to live, as she pulls the arrow out of Inuyasha's heart. Right off the bat, there's a lot of symbolism in the first episode that will continue to play out and be explored throughout the rest of the series, but first, let's look at the Centipede Lady and the Shikan no Tama. This jewel, generally just called the Sacred Jewel in the anime, holds a large amount of spiritual power and can be purified or corrupted depending on who possesses it. And for the record, a yokai is essentially a Japanese ghost, fairy, or demon which can range from possessed toilet paper or discarded umbrellas straight up to troll demons called oni. The oni. Like you think there's a lot of Pokemon? The Japanese had hundreds of years to come up with yokai for literally anything and everything that does and does not exist. And this centipede lady is a warped omokade whose evil nature and desire for the jewel turned her into what we see here. And that's not it, if you were to do a little research on just about any story in Inuyasha, you would find that most of, if not all the yokai within these tales are twisted versions of a legitimate piece of Japanese folklore. The reason they're twisted is because of the hatred and evil that permeated the Sengoku Jidai. Now second, the Shikan no Tama is eventually swallowed by a crow yokai called a Yatagras. However, this is a Shibugaras because it has three eyes instead of three feet. The crow is shot down by Kagome, however, her arrow strikes the jewel inside of it directly, breaking it and scattering it all over Japan, which sets the stage for the show to take place. Now her and Inuyasha, who for the record is a giant butt munch at first and is only out for himself, have to travel around the feudal era to collect the fragments of the jewel before it's gathered by someone or something with evil intentions. Now this is kind of a genius idea, there's no exact count of how many shards there are of this jewel, so the narrative has infinite time to weave itself through different characters and settings as it sees fit, and it does. Just a shard of this jewel grants anyone wielding it far greater power than they had previously. Part of the reason Inuyasha even accepted this quest to begin with is due to his desire to become a full yokai instead of a half yokai with the power of the jewel, a subplot we're not going to get into in this video. Video. But this all sets up the ability for Kagome to come across nearly infinite scenarios where strange and altered creatures unfettered by a modern civilization run rampant with evil. But what I find even more interesting is Inuyasha's parallels to Dragon Ball. See, when Dragon Ball started, it was a far different show than what it came to be, obviously. The first arc was all about finding these sacred wish-granting balls, and along the way Goku and Bulma pick up a group of strange friends to help them find these balls. It was an adventure story, not a power fantasy like it eventually became. Ironically, the course of Dragon Ball's history was changed thanks to the martial arts tournament craze in Japanese manga in the 80s, a craze that inspired Rumiko Takahashi to create Ranma Half. However, her later work in Uyasha would be far more derivative of the original nature of Dragon Ball, even adopting the Journey to the West formula we see quite often in Japanese entertainment, but particularly in Dragon Ball. So really quickly, Journey to the West is arguably the most famous story in the eastern part of the world, in which a monk tasked with a holy journey, a monkey named Sun Wukong, whose Japanese translation is Son Goku, a shape-shifting pig guy and a godly general turned desert golem of sorts, journeying across China fighting all sorts of demons and spirits to bring holy scriptures to where they need to be. Also the horse is a character too, I don't know, it's a thing. Anyways, in Dragon Ball, obviously Bulma takes the role of the monk, Goku is Son Goku, Oolong is the pig dude, and Yamcha would be the desert bandit. However, these archetypes are also in Inuyasha, yet almost more literal. Inuyasha takes the role of Son Goku being powerful and wily and even devious at times, which is more accurate to the original Wukong. The Buddha's beads placed around his neck, which Kagome used to subdue him by saying SIT! That's right, big sit. Hmm? <laughs> say that karma includes bad thoughts. Is the exact same method used by the priest in Journey to the West to subdue Wukong. And then we have the rest of the party who gradually comes together, the shape-shifting Kitsune Shippo, and the lecherous monk with a black hole in his hand, Miroku, and then of course there's Sango, who I think was just added in to be awesome, and another female lead. But it's Kagome who is the most important as the central character, and while not ordained, she is a priestess or Miko with immense spiritual power. Of course, 
This is power she comes to realize and utilize slowly as time goes on to give the series a sense of progression. However, where everything truly comes together is in Kagome's counterpart, Kikyo, Lady Kaede's older sister, who was the most powerful Miko of her time and guardian of the Shikan no Tama. Her and a wild Inuyasha fell in love and made a pact to relinquish their power and be together 50 years before Kagome falls through the well. However, they were tricked by the biggest dick in Japan, Naraku, which ended in them thinking they betrayed each other and resulting in both of their deaths. Now, Kagome is a reincarnation of Kikyo from the future, something that inevitably leads her and Inuyasha down a path of juvenile courtship, which is violently interrupted by an oni named Arasue who brings Kikyo back from the dead. But like, not all the way. Kikyo comes back kind of warped, her body is just grave dirt and clay, her soul is tainted with hatred, and she becomes a major wild card for a long time. She survives by supplementing her body with the souls of deceased maidens she collects using creepy snake things called Shinidamachu, and what's worse is that her revival deeply burdens and confuses Inuyasha, leading to a lot of angst. It's reiterated many times within the series that Kikyo is very much dead and that she belongs that way, obviously that being the natural course of things, but for Inuyasha, her revival opens wounds that eventually would have healed had she not been thrust back in his face. Kikyo becomes a roadblock between him and Kagome, but also between Inuyasha and his past, and this is really where I want to highlight some of the genius of Rumiko Takahashi. While on the surface Inuyasha can come off as a B-grade action shonen, as a package, it is an in-depth look at love and what it can do, especially first love. It's something that shapes who we become later in life, and Kikyo and Inuyasha's love was tainted and taken from them along with their lives. However, Inuyasha was able to recover and rejoin a world Kikyo was no longer part of. The struggles brought on by her semi-revival are representative of what it's like to overcome love lost, and as we see with Inuyasha and how it affects Kagome, who is very much alive and of this world, it is a visceral experience. Inuyasha is torn between the past and the present and has major difficulty making a choice between the two, and those time periods are marked by two very significant women, Kikyo and Kagome. And time and time again, Inuyasha finds himself in the arms of Kikyo, who in reality is nothing but a ghost, a shell of what a person is. However, it's the memory of her and the intensity of the feelings they had which bring Inuyasha to the brink, as Kikyo has no qualms admitting that she does intend to drag Inuyasha to hell with her. And I think to write this kind of story requires someone to have literally felt this way before, because that kind of passion isn't something you can just synthesize. Personally, my first love was very intense. It came in freshman year of high school, and it was a time when I desperately needed that kind of affection, something to believe in. And that need sent the flames of that love out of control, and within a year, it had burned out. Not for me, but for her. And the absence of that feeling left me with a hole in my gut for years, because the need doesn't just go away. I also lost a girlfriend once. It's a long, complicated, and very sad story that I'm not ready to totally get into. But after I finally got the courage to leave her and the horrible life she had me nailed to, she ended up dying two months later leaving me with a ghost. Obviously not literally, but certain memories do feel like they haunt you in a way, you know what I mean? And Inuyasha and Kikyo died hating each other, only to find out post-mortem that that hate was synthesized by a third party. But it's something that happened in the past, it's something that needs to be dealt with so that Inuyasha can live, both literally and metaphorically. In the beginning, I mentioned Kagome's first direct statement to Inuyasha, I choose to live. And I think that underneath everything in this show, which believe me I have only scratched the surface of, is the true message. That each day we choose to live, that we have to choose to live, because to quote Lady Kaede, time does not move forward for the dead. And what is death but an end to things? Moments, eras, feelings, and once gone, time no longer moves forward for them, but instead leaves traces of what once was. or ghosts. It's why moving forward is sometimes the hardest, but always the most important thing to do. So anyway, what happens with Inuyasha, Kagome, and Kikyo? Well, you either already know or you don't, so I recommend before we do another video on the subject that you watch the show 
or watch every single one of our other videos six times while I get to work on it. Hey, thanks so much for making it this far into the video. There's so much left to talk about when it comes to Inuyasha. I mean, there are characters that we didn't even mention like Sashomaru or Jokin or Myoga or Naraku even really, like we barely talked about him at all, but it's it's so difficult when you have such a long series with so many characters to, to really give everybody the time that they need in one video. So we are going to be coming back to Inuyasha again, definitely. One of the things that I wanted to mention before we ended the video was that I actually prefer watching this one in the dub. Yeah, I know that's not something that you're really supposed to say as a professional weeb, but the dub is excellent and I very much prefer the voices that are done in the dub over the subbed version. I think that they got Inuyasha's character very well. Um, his attitude and kind of his like st goofiness like they, there's a lot of humor in the show that I didn't really talk about very much and if you're interested in reading the manga uh, I would like to say that the anime is very faithful to the manga as far as I've seen so far I'm about 200 chapters in and I don't think that there's anything that the anime didn't miss or even make better. The only thing that the manga has that the anime doesn't is that it's very crude. Like there's there's a lot of curse, like unnecessary cursing in the manga, which is funny. Like it, I, obviously cursing doesn't bother me at all. I do it all the time, but uh, it's just like every other word in the manga. Enough blabbering though. We have to get down to business. So I would like to first thank our very special lucky patron of the week. JJ, thank you so much for being an awesome Bonsai Pop patron, being in Discord, and just doing your thing, helping us out. Seriously, without Patreon right now, we would be totally screwed. Uh, YouTube is having a really tough time with the economy being kind of in the dumpster, so uh, we're there. We're with you guys. We understand how you're feeling, uh, but thankfully we have some very, very helpful, supportive people that are kind of trying to help push us through this. So secondly, I have to thank our very special Super Saiyan God level tier Patreon guy of the week who is the school bus rocking that Discord Nitro boost. Thank you for that. That is awesome. And man, uh, just a generous donation you've been here since the beginning or the like very very close to it so thank you for sticking with us as long as you have uh, school bus and uh, love the Kana avatar as always don't forget to follow us on Twitter and Instagram that is bonsai underscore pop at bonsai underscore pop on both of those check us out on twitch where I do streams I just got my dreamcast stream setup going on so I'm gonna be streaming in the highest quality a dreamcast can put out it's good it's beautiful it looks great I'm very happy Happy about it and that is twitch.tv slash bonsai pop and as always i'm mike this is bonsai pop and i'll see you next week thanks for watching bye